Church, and uh, let's open up our Bibles this morning. We're going to get right to it as we open up. And if you need a Bible, then we have one for you. We constantly give them away because uh, we want you to be able to have the Word of God in your home and be able to read it. Uh, but we're opening up to the book of Philippians. Philippians, which is in the New Testament, it's almost way back toward the end of your Bibles. There's an index in the front that will tell you the page number to get there. But we're open up to Philippians, and we're in the third chapter as we've been doing this series called The Joy-Filled Life. And we got the words on the screen too. So let's read from the book of Philippians 3. And we're going to be starting in verse um, 17, 15. We got there? We all there? Awesome. If anybody needs a Bible, just raise your hand. We'll get you one. So, Philippians 3, and I'm going to start right at 17. Join together in following my example. Brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Let's just pause right there and, and um, just ask God to open our eyes and ears as we pray to him. Father God, I just ask this morning is, as we get into this message, as we get into this sermon, Father, I just ask that you bless us with your presence of your Holy Spirit. I ask that you're here to show us something new, something that we have never seen before in your scriptures. I ask that you speak into our life because we desire more than anything for transformation. And we can't do that without an open heart, without an openness to you. And so, Father, I, I just pray right now that you um, speak to our minds and may those thoughts transfer to our heart and we, may it give us a passion to serve you and to honor you and to continue to transform to be more like your son, Jesus. We need you. We can't do this without you. And so bless it. What I speak right now, bless your word and speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What I got this morning for you is really uh, one sermon point, so it's very easy, okay? You're going to be able to remember it. One sermon point and a few questions. It's very different than what I normally preach. I normally preach three sermon points or more, but I want you to just take this one point away and some questions for some conviction. Paul starts off right away. And he says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So Paul says that you are an example. This Greek word example actually means um, to impress, to put an impression on. And, and there was a basketball player back in, in the early uh, 90s. You guys all know who Charles Barkley is? Yes, right? Charles Barkley knew the game of basketball. He dominated on the court. He trash talked. He, he was known for his behavior of how he treated other players and how he was willing to win at all costs. And Back in the early 90s, Charles Barkley is also known for a quote that he said. When asked, how is your behavior on the court reflective of your life all off the court and what does that do as an example to others? Charles Barkley became known as, as this. He says, I am not a role model. Because I dunk a basketball does not make me a role model. I'm a basketball player. I'm not a role model. And that sparked so much controversy of how celebrities and athletes and different people, are they really role models to us? Here, 
what Paul is saying. Join together in following my example. If you back up to verse 15, he says, all of us then who are mature should take such view of things. Only let us, in verse 16, live up to what we have already attained. Notice he's using the plural, us, ours. Follow in my example. What, what Paul is saying is very contradictory to what Charles Barkley said. In fact, we are all role models. We are all role models. And then he continues on. Everyone is a role model is what he's saying. How you act is how people are seeing you. How you act is affecting others around you. How you live your life, people are soaking that in. Everyone is a role model. Whether you're an athlete, whether you're a celebrity, whether you're a mother, whether you're a father, whether you're a brother or sister, or whether you're just a friend, you are a role model in the way you live your life. That's what Paul is saying. He's not just addressing the Christians, even though he's addressing the church of Philippi. He's addressing all of us when he says that you set the example. Join together in my following, my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have seen us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Follow in our footsteps is what he's saying. Now this Greek word example means impression. When I was a couple years ago, I took uh, my kids out to uh, a camping trip, just me and, and my son, and, and he had a couple friends, and there was a couple of the fathers, and we spent the, the night camping, and, and there was a, we spent the night camping right underneath a train track. And the idea was that every couple hours, this train passes through the track. And so we went up there with a handful of pennies, and we put them, placed them on the track, and we allowed the train to pass over. And then the fun thing to do was, after the train was finished passing over, we would go up and we'd cl collect the pennies. We'd find out how many we could see. And all the pennies were flattened. All the pennies had an impression on them, and they were all different. And so we'd go and collect these pennies. And, and what Paul is saying here is this, this Greek word typos, which means impression. He's like, you, there is an impression. Lead by my, follow my example, my impression that I leave on to you. I wish I could bring up here a, a, a big memory foam mattress as an example. Because... If you've ever sat on a memory foam mattress, okay, you know how soft it is and how cushy it is. And, and when you get up, it leaves an impression of your body. In fact, one of the, the great things, the sales points is when you actually lay back down, it remembers your shape and your mold. And it's, it, after a while, your impression is left on there. And so you sleep more comfortably because it's always on there to leave a lasting impression. That's what this word example means. So Paul is saying, follow my impression. Follow my example. I have impressed something onto you. You got to remember who Paul was. Paul planted the church in Philippi. He's writing to the Philippian church. He's like, I mentored you. I was with you. You learned from me. Follow my impression. However, I want you to think in your mind. Who's made a lasting impression on you in your life? Who is it that comes to your mind if you think about somebody who's made a lasting impression on your life? Is it a mom? Is it your dad? Is it a friend? We can have good impressions and bad impressions. Who is it that's made everybody... Now when I ask that, I know you get a name in your head. You can think about it. I can tell you, when I first became a believer, I was trying to figure out this Christian thing. Do I really want to accept Jesus Christ? Do I really want to grow? Do I want to do my own thing? Do I want to keep going? And I remember leaving for work one morning, coming out of the door at 6.30 a.m., and the sun was just coming up, and I see in the driveway somebody who had been mentoring me, spending time with me. It was a pastor. He was planning a church and he was sitting in his truck and I just looked at him before I got into my car and I'm like, what is he doing? Is he, is he sleeping? Is he, is he grabbing a couple Z's before he has to leave? And he was actually sitting there at the steering wheel reading his Bible and praying. 
And I remember that so clearly. It made a lasting impression on me because I thought, here is someone who's actually spending the time, the free moments that they have in the car, reading the Bible and praying. This must be something they truly embrace. And it left an impression on me. Sometimes we have good impressions and, and sometimes we have bad impressions. Look at what Paul says in the book of Philippians. He says the same thing when it comes to people. Sometimes there's good examples. Sometimes there's bad examples. Verse 18, For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So right after Paul says, hey, follow after my impression, he goes and says, but there's others out there who are trying to leave an impression on your life. There's others out there who are trying to leave a different example for you to absorb in. There's others out there who are trying to take you away from these godly things that I'm trying to show you. There are two different worlds and you have to make a choice. You can follow my example or you can follow the example of others. And so who has left a lasting impression on your life. You see, sometimes we have these great examples. We have these, these memories of people who have just spoken to our life. They've loved us. They've cared for us. They've helped motivate us and encourage us. And those are the people we're normally drawn to. But there's, sometimes we have bad experiences as well. Sometimes we have people that absorb the energy of us from us. We have people in our lives who are, are negative. We have people in our lives who tend to rub off their negativity. And they're the ones that just never see to see the cup half full or, or, or half. They always see it half empty. They never see it half full. And you know who I'm talking about. And they just seem to absorb you. Look at what Paul says. He says, they live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is in destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their God is their stomach. I think of a buffet. Think about that. You go to a buffet and what do you want to do? You want to eat, right? You go to a buffet and you're going to fill up, but not only are you going to eat to get full, what do you do? You tend to overeat. You eat as much as possible because if you have that, that nature like I do, if I'm paying $8 for a plate of food, I better get my money's worth. And so I'm not just going to eat one plate of food. I'm going to go back a second time and a third time and I'm going to eat as much as I can. I'm going to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner and get as full as I can. I am going to fill up there because I'm going to get my money's worth at that time. And if I take my family to the buffet, I push them all up there. We're going to overeat. We're going to overindulge. We used to go to Pizza Hut after church when I was a teenager. And uh, we would see how many pieces of pizza that we could actually eat. I'll tell you that there was a person in our group that could eat 21 pieces of pizza. That was the record. Unbelievable. I got close, but I couldn't do 21. And we would overeat. We would overindulge until our stomachs hurt. And what Paul is saying is, look at these people. They're eating. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They're possessed and, and desiring worldly things. Things of this world. They're overeating on things of this world. They're filling up on things of this world. They're filling up on things that they're chasing after. They're overindulging on the stuff that they want to pursue. And Paul is saying that it's a bad example. It's a bad example of chasing after our own things. Now, if we're going to leave a lasting impression, I thought of this example. And here I have a bucket of water and a sponge. Now, when a sponge is wet, 
and you press on it and you use it and you mold it, what happens? It often takes the shape. I could wet this sponge, place my hand on it, press into it, and it will take the shape of my hand, correct? Sometimes when a sponge is brand new, like this one, it's rather hard. It's hard and it, you can't really use it. You can't really pour any water out of it. I think of this as what Paul is saying. It's like, follow after my example. Let me leave a lasting impression on you. But if we're like this sponge, then you can't press on this. You can't imprint on this. It's so hard that it's not willing to absorb anything. And sometimes our hearts are the same way. Sometimes we've been beat up so much in life. Sometimes we retaliate so much. Sometimes we put up this wall all around us because we don't want any more negativity in that we're not allowing it to affect us anymore. It's a security measure. If we don't lower the walls, then they can't hurt us. They can't infiltrate us. They can't press on us. Those people of the world, those people after their own stomach, they can't affect us anymore. And you would say, That's, that should be a good thing. You know the dangerous thing in that? Is that if we put up such a wall where nobody's able to impress on us, then God can't impress on us either. If we put up such a wall that our hearts become hard like this sponge, and Paul is saying, Lead, follow my example, let me impress on you, because I have the things of Christ in mind. If we put up such a wall, then, then no longer can God impress his will or spirit on us, because we're following after our will and our spirit. That's what they're saying, is, is these people are chasing after themselves. And so they can no longer be impressed upon. And so that's why we pray. We pray, God, open our hearts. We pray, God, break us. And we don't like to be broken. It's not a comfortable feeling. But we pray, God, break us because we want you to be able to impress on us. Here's the thing. If we allow God to impress on us, I, I, I love this, then instantly we become soft, just like this sponge. And if you back up in Philippians a little bit, Paul gives this command to the believers of Philippi, the Phil, Philipp, Philippian church, the believers in Philippi. What does he say? He says, to be poured out. Well, if you're absorbing the things of God on a daily basis and you're absorbing God into your life, it's become so easy to be poured out because you have extra substance. If God is pouring his Holy Spirit into you just as this water is in this sponge, then you can pour out to others. You can be an example to others because God is pouring into you and you are pouring out. The most dangerous situation, I think, is for the believers who have accepted Jesus Christ and they stop allowing God to pour into them. The believers who have accepted Jesus Christ and they're no longer following God's impression upon their life. They're no longer being absorbed on a daily basis. They're no longer allowing God to pour into them. And so what happens is you're soft enough where people can impress you, impress on you. You're soft enough where people can actually make an imprint onto you. And so they push in, they push in, they push in, they push in. And then they let go, and there's an impression on you. They push in, they push in, they push in, they push in, and they let go, and they impress on you. If you're allowing people who are negative to do that in your life, if you're allowing people who do not have the mindset of God in your life, they're impressing on you and hurting you and beating you up. And when they let go, it's left this way. It's left with a mark of impression. You're left scarred. You're left wounded. You're left hurting and instantly, you push back and you become hard. You no longer become authentic. You no longer become open. You no longer share. You no longer want to be in community because these people have hurt you. They've scarred you. And so you stop associating with them. The wonderful thing about God, you need to know this. The wonderful thing about God is that if I dip this back in the water, 
it instantly absorbs back out, what happens? The impression goes away. If someone is negative in your life, if someone is hurting you in your life, the more you absorb God, what happens? The more you are able to pour out, the more that the healing begins to take place, the more that this absorbs and it expands and God begins to remove all of those things that are marking your life. So you got someone negative and they're pressing on you and they're pressing on you and you spend time absorbing more with God and expanding your sponge, then you're able to deal with that person easier. You're able to be more effective around them. They're not able to infiltrate you as badly. Why? Because you're expanding your sponge so they can press and they can press and as they press out what's happening, you're just, dr- you're just pouring out God's Holy Spirit on them. They're pressing on you. They're giving you a hard time and you're just pouring out God's Holy Spirit on them and that's grace. You can be more graceful to people around you when you're absorbed with the things of God. But when you're feeling empty and you're feeling run down and you're no longer reading your Bible and you're no longer in daily prayer and you're no longer listening to sermons and you're no longer coming to church and you're no longer feeling God's presence on you on a daily basis. When people press on you, what happens? They leave this lasting impression, this wound, and it hurts. And what Paul is telling us is follow in my example. Absorb All of these things. And the more that you absorb, you will be able to pour out your grace on all of these people around you. The whole reason why they're hurting you and it's feeling is because you're not absorbed enough with God's Holy Spirit around you. And God's Holy Spirit is offering it. He's offering it. Look at what Paul says. You never thought you'd learn so much from a sponge, huh? You'll never wash the dishes the same way again. You never thought that such a powerful illustration was going to communicate God's Holy Spirit, but I'm telling you, this is life-changing right here. He says, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Who are you still allowing to pour into your life? Are you allowing the people who set a godly example to pour into your life? Are you allowing people to impress on your life like Paul who says, follow after my example? Well, Jesus was the same way. You see, you got to remember, there's, there's two different people Paul's talking about, okay? In the New Testament, when Paul actually converted to Christianity, he began to preach. He began to go into different cities and he began to tell them about Jesus. But before Paul was actually a Christian, what happened? He put Christians to death because he didn't believe in Christianity. He did not believe in the way. He was a Pharisee. His Faith was built on rules and regulations that he had been taught his entire life. He had been nurtured from a very young age up and he had allowed people to impress on him rules and regulations of religion. And he followed those rules and regulations. He was top of his class. He was one of the top Pharisees, studied under some of the best Pharisees and theologians and he put Christians to death. And when he decided that Jesus Christ was the way because Jesus revealed himself to him, he instantly instantly converted and began to preach it. But that the people who he studied under, they didn't go away. What they did was they followed him from town to town to town, telling the people that he had the wrong message now, and they would beat him and they would stone him. And he lived a life of suffering and persecution for it. So when he's writing about these two examples, he's saying, listen, I have the example of Jesus. Follow after me. But these other people, these gluttons who follow after the world, they follow after religion. They're going to hurt you. Quit following after them. They do not have your best desire at, they do not have your, your interest at heart and their best desire. And so he says, don't listen to them. Isn't it true that sometimes the church has been the people that have hurt other people the most? Isn't it true that sometimes it's Christians that have done more wounds to other Christians? I talk to people all the time about rules and regulations of religion. People who grew up 20 years ago, 
When I used to pastor in Holland, Michigan, would say that they could not ride their bikes on Sunday mornings because Sunday was a Sabbath. In fact, they were taught that they could not have fun on the Sabbath. They weren't allowed to watch TV. They weren't allowed to play. You could not mow the lawn. You could not go shopping. It was a day of just rest, so you would go home and sleep. It sounds kind of boring to me. It's rules and regulations. You see... When I first came to church, I was told lots of different things. You have to dress a certain way. You have to act a certain way. You have to speak a certain way. And it almost made you feel like you weren't accepted. Rules and regulations. There's a whole reason why we as a church, I wear jeans when I preach. Because I want you to know that you can come as you are and still be accepted by Jesus Christ. I want you to know that it's not about rules and regulations. Yes, there's about following the Holy Spirit, but let the Holy Spirit convict you on what God's Word says about His rules. But it's not about all these rules and regulations in order to make yourself feel completed because the truth is that we are all sinners and we all fall short. And what, that's what Paul's saying. He's saying there's rules and regulations of people that have hurt other people. And that's not the example to follow after. The example is Christ. And Jesus said the same thing. He said in, in Luke 9.23 when he called his disciples, he walked around and what was the first words that he did? He went down to the ocean side. He found some fishermen. Some fishermen, and I can go into a whole sermon on that, how, how they had failed out of school, that they weren't good enough to be um, Pharisees of Paul's day. And Jesus found the people who had failed out of religious school, went to them and commissioned them. And here's the words he said to them. He said, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. And as a rabbi, when you called someone to follow you, they would actually follow you around. They would memorize what you did. They would try to reenact that. And they would do it over and over again until the habit actually became who they are. You're imitating the rabbi. You're following after the leader. Follow me means let me make a lasting impression on your life. Become so much like me. Well, how does any of this relate to, Chris to Christmas? Christmas is a time where we actually celebrate the Jesus Christ, the God who was humble enough to come to this earth as a little infant and be under parents who were sinful, who were not perfect, and he had to humble himself where he actually allowed God to pour into his life through the Holy Spirit. He humbled himself to become a baby where he had to learn all things again. He had to go through adolescence. He had to go through maturity. He had to go through his teenage years. He had to go through young adulthood. And people are pouring into him. And he has to make the decision, am I going to allow people to pour into me, these rules and regulations, these people of the church, these people who don't know God's way, am I going to allow them to continue to pour into me or am I going to allow God to pour into me with his Holy Spirit? And Jesus got alone one-on-one -on -one all through his ministry. He's out teaching, he sends his disciples on and he goes and spends time with God because he's allowing God to make an impression on his life. Because as people make an impression on his life, as people hurt him, as people tried to kill him, Jesus had to spend more time with the Father in order to expand his sponge to handle those people and to show them grace. And the more time he spent with God the Father, the more grace he was able to pour out of the Holy Spirit onto these people's lives. And so Jesus is spending time with these people. And so Christmas is a whole holiday where God himself came off of his throne, humbled himself to spend time with people making an impression on their life. And he calls us to do the same. Who's continuing to impress on your life, you need to think about who your friends are. Are they impressing on your life? I guarantee they are as everyone's a role model. You need to think about your family members. Who's that family member you just don't get along with? And are you absorbing enough grace of God to be able to pour out grace to them? Because that's exactly what Jesus showed. He showed forgiveness. He showed humility. He showed reconciliation. He went and died for those who stoned him and sinned against him and hated him. And he says, those are the ones who I have died for. While they were yet sinners, I died for them so that they could experience salvation. That's who Jesus was. 
And he says, as I have impressed onto you humility, as I have impressed onto you forgiveness, as I have shown you what it means to be reconciled to the Father, now you are to go practice that amongst each other. So who is it that's impressing on your life? Is it the people who are negative? Is it the people who just want to go out and have fun and they're following after their own desires? Is it people who actually have your best interest at heart? Are those the type of people you're spending your time with and allowing them to impress on you? Because Paul says, follow after my example. And here is why in closing. But our citizenship, in verse 20, is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What Paul says is, listen, there is an afterlife. There is something after this life. This life is temporary and your home is in heaven. Your home is in the future glory in verse 20. But our citizenship, that's where we belong. Our citizenship, that's the country we belong to is in heaven. That's where we're citizens of, of heaven. We're God's people. We belong with him. You are not a citizen in Philippi, he's saying. You are not a citizen in Rome. You are not a citizen of the United States, okay? Your citizenship is with God in heaven if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And he has a claim of rights to you. You have salvation. That is your right if you belong to that citizenship. He promises all of these things of walking with you, of being with you, but he says you're no longer allowed to allow these other people to impress on you because here's the flip side. Think about the person who's impressed the most on you. Here's the last question I want to ask you. Who is it that you're making a lasting impression on? Who is it that you make oppression on around you? Who is it that you spend time with? And this is where I get so convicted as a father. Because kids are like little sponges. And even as Jesus tells us that we need to take on the faith of a child, why? Because I think we need to trust God and, and, and be sponges with him. Our kids are sponges to us. They watch us. They mimic us. They follow in our footsteps. Last week I saw a Facebook YouTube video of a, a four-year-old dressed as a gangster and he was holding a, a, a pistol in his hand and he was, had a phone on his other hand and he was cussing up a storm to the other person on the phone. It outraged me. These parents are literally raising their child to become a gangster and teaching them to do so. You know, that might be an extreme case, but I don't know how much we're any better at times when we act the same way. Our kids are watching us, they're mimicking us, and, and we're not la leaving a lasting impression that Paul says, follow my example, allow me to impress on your life because I'm following after Christ. Paul is a visual example of what it means to be a believer. He says, as I follow after Christ, allow me to shine so bright that you follow after me and that way you follow after Christ. Are we doing the same thing? There's a Casting Crown song that's called uh, Slow Fade. And I think about that. It says it's a slow fade. It's a slow fade away from what you, where you want to be. It's a slow fade to fall away from Jesus. It, it, it's slowly we fade away and our kids watch, are looking at that. And then at the very end of the song, there's a little boy that comes on and sings as a chorus and says, Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Our kids are watching what we're watching on TV. Our kids are affected by what we listen to, the music in the car. Our kids are affected by our conversations all around us. And if it's not our kids, if you're not a parent this morning, I guarantee it's a, it's a sibling that you have, a younger brother or sister. I guarantee it's a, a co-worker. Or even worse, if you're not making that impression of Jesus Christ as Paul saying, hey, let me impress on you, lead by my example. If, if you knew that you were an example to somebody, would it change your attitude? If you knew that you were leaving a lasting impression, that somebody was living in your house watching you and being molded by how you lived your life, would it change your life? 
Paul says it should as a believer, that you should be around people and leave a lasting impression on them because your citizenship is in heaven and you need to live like you are living in heaven here on earth with those around you. Your co-workers, it should leave a lasting impression on. Your family members, it should leave a lasting impression on. Especially around Christmas time when we get together with family, they should see you. And what Paul says in Philippians is that you should shine so brightly that they see Jesus Christ. You should be living your life in such a way that they want to see the transformation take place in you and they want to embrace that for themselves. To live so brightly that we're living examples for others and leaving impressions on them. It only is possible if we're allowing God to leave an impression on us where we can pour out into them. Who are you leaving an impression on? Are you being filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis that you can just pour out His Spirit onto others and leave an impression of Jesus Christ in their lives? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. And we know of your grace, that you poured out this grace to us. You showed us your grace as not only did you call us to follow you as your disciples, and you want to us, and you're leading us, and we're following after you, but Lord, you came into this earth to die for us, to humble yourself, to sacrifice yourself for each of us. Man, that's a lasting impression. Father God, we just pray as sometimes we allow things into our lives that aren't right, as we allow people to make impressions on us, and sometimes, Lord, it, it was with a kid, and, and it was our parents, and I know very well in this room that not all parents are good parents, and Father, I also know that none of us are perfect, and so sometimes as a child, we were innocent, and a parent left an impression on us that hurt us and wounded us. Father, help us to open our hearts to you knowing that you are perfect, knowing that you will not hurt us, that the things you put us through are for our benefit and they're not to harm us. Help us to trust you that you are this loving and gracious Father to us, Lord, and that we can trust you. Father, I just pray that we open our hearts to you and we absorb you. We absorb your spirit so the people around us of this world who do not have their mind set on you, that continue to try to pull us away from you, Father, may we be so stuck to you and glued to you that we pour out into them. That they don't infiltrate us, but we infiltrate them. That they don't make an impression on us, but we make an impression on them. An impression of grace. Father, we're a living example, you call us. We are role models. And so help us to be a role model in our life with your Holy Spirit. We can't do this by ourselves. We can't do this alone. We need you. And so come into our life and fill us up so we can pour out into the lives of others. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>